So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Ron Miller, and these are called Founders Stories. And we're going to talk to Tracy this morning about her story. So, you know, when I think about your story, uh, I think it's really a proof point that any industry can be disrupted. Mm -hmm. And when you think about construction, it's just like, in some ways, it's really stuck in time, right? <laughs> Technologically. So we're doing okay. <laughs> how, how did you come up with the idea for Plane Grid? Yeah, so I think the paper problem is very obvious to all construction engineers and construction managers and field workers in the field. Um, just to give you an idea of how bad the paper problem is, so the heart of construction is just a lot of construction blueprints, information. It's all tracked on paper right now. And they're constantly, constantly changing. You can imagine a wall being moved just 50 feet. Suddenly, 50 sheets of blueprints have to change with it. And it's not unheard of to accidentally build off of the wrong drawings all the time. What that means is you have to take down the work you've built and then rebuild it up. And as a contractor, you're only paid once to do the job. Um, on one of the projects I was on, we rebuilt the operating rooms five times. Oh my goodness. Five times because we couldn't distribute paper to the field fast enough. So that's where the idea from Planger came from. So you came up with this idea in the 2010, 2011 timeframe. The iPad was brand new. And I think if you think back, um, it was considered pretty much a consumer device. And even you know, sophisticated enterprise businesses, you know, the most progressive ones were just experimenting with it as a business tool. You had told me that at the time, the state of the art was the walkie-talkie for, for, uh, for the construction industry. So how did you convince these people to move their most valuable paper assets to the cloud, which was also kind of a uh, mysterious concept back then, and onto the iPad? Yeah, I think anyone who sees Plan Grid you know, never says, like, oh, that's a bad idea. Everyone right. loves Plan Grid that sees mm -hmm. Plan Grid. But construction's a really interesting industry. So if you look at labor productivity over the last 60 years, literally every single industry has seen a drastic increase in productivity, in labor productivity, except for one industry. One industry hasn't figured out how to be more productive in the last 60 years, and it's construction. So if we think about all other industries, how did we become more productive? It's through computers, it's through software, but you can't take the IBM personal computer into the field. I mean, you, you could, but right. you know, the thing's heavy, you have to build your building, Wi-Fi doesn't really work, so it's pretty much useless. And so when Steve Jobs announced the first generation iPad in 2010, my co-founders and I knew that it would revolutionize the construction industry. We were just the first ones to build software for it, and that's why we're the number one construction mobile software today. So I heard a story that early on you couldn't convince them to get iPads, so you had to buy your own iPads. Yeah, Could so you tell it's, that story? Yeah, it's 2011, you know, people are still kind of not sure about the iPad. It's sort of still this like, this toy, right? This joke. People are, you know, you guys remember this. They, they put the iPads to their faces and they're talking to it like an iPhone. <laughs> and we knew that it was perfect for construction. It's a fully powered computer that's lightweight enough. It's small enough to shove in your, you know, there's even like safety vests with big pockets and they mm -hmm. fit nicely in them. And, um, but you know, it's 2011, 2012, so not very many people have iPads, certainly not in the enterprise. And we went out and we bought iPads. We maxed out our credit cards. Uh, and at the time, they, there was limits on it. So you'd have to stand in line. And then Apple would only let you buy like two or three at a time. Right. And so we, we took home like 18 iPads from one store. I mean, we, we paid for it, of course. But that was all we had. And my four co-founders and I, we got really paranoid that night back at our hacker house in Sunnyvale. We thought for sure that we were going to get robbed that night. So we started hiding them. Um, I remember <laughs> Ralph put one on top of the refrigerator. And I said, oh, no, what if the thief is like really tall? Then they'll be able to see all our iPads and steal them. And so we like put them underneath pots. And uh, I think Ryan even put one in the microwave. I mean, we obviously didn't get robbed that night, right? Because oh, we lived in that. a nice part of Sunnyvale. <laughs> so shifting gears a little bit here, um, you work in two male, or you have worked in two male-dominated industries. Um, you worked in construction first, and now you work as a CEO in technology business in Silicon Valley. So I guess I, I, I want to know what it's like being a woman in a male-dominated industry, and has it been an, have you encountered any kinds of issues of doing yeah. that? Yeah. Um, 
So when Tracy wakes up every morning, Tracy mm -hmm. doesn't think like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a female. Right. When I wake up in the morning, I think, wow, I have a lot of work to do. I better get showered and caffeined up and get my ass to work. Um, so it wasn't exactly something I had to overcome. And I was just really lucky. So I went into a career in construction engineering, and I worked for a really good construction firm. The project managers, superintendents, and foremans I worked with were just totally supportive of me. You know, certainly I made a lot of mistakes, but they were there to walk me through it, help me grow as an engineer, and they did a good job. I'm, I'm a damn good engineer. Yeah. And so when I became a founder, um, again, I just chose good co-founders to work with. And these guys are my best friends. They're the best co-founders in the world. And I wouldn't be able to do this without them. And they were always supportive of me. And I think they've believed in me in times when I didn't even believe in myself. And then I also partnered with really good business partners, right? right. Y Combinator, Sequoia. These are firms that have been there to help me when I've needed their help. They've certainly been there to kick me in the ass when I've needed it, helped us focus, demanded excellence from us. Um, but you know, it's not like they've helped me because I'm female. Right. They it's help not. me because they help all their founders because they're yeah. good firms, right? And I don't know, it's just not something I've had to overcome. But if we look at construction engineering and we look at software engineering and just tech in general, yeah, there's a lot of dudes, right? There's a lot of males and there's probably a lot of white males. And there's nothing against white males. I love white males. I'm married to one of them. <laughs> But it's a problem. There's not enough females. There's not enough minorities in engineering, in software engineering, and tech. And that means that this world is missing out on a lot of great structures, a lot of great buildings, a lot of great companies, and a lot of great leaders. And we need to do something about it. So as a female and as a minority, I want to let all females and minorities out there know who are thinking about going into construction or who are thinking about going into software engineering and tech to just do it. I, like, there aren't that many haters out there. Yes, there's haters, but there's a lot more smart, hardworking people who believe that intelligence is equally distributed across race and gender, and they are here to work with you. They want to work with you, and we need to solve this problem now. That's a great answer. Thank you. So, so you had another you know, pretty tough situation. One of your co-founders, um, in the first year that you guys were, were putting together a company, got sick with cancer and, and, and ended up dying. I mean, that must have been just really incredibly hard. And I'm just wondering how you even went on with a company under those circumstances. Yeah, Antoine, Antoine was our good friend. He was our co-founder and chief med scientist. He was diagnosed with cancer at 27. It just happens like that sometimes. It's yeah. complete chaos, right? It's totally unfair. And he fought it for a while. When his cancer came back, he decided not to put his body through chemo anymore. And he wanted to build Plangard with us, and that was a decision we completely supported. Around that time, we were accepted into Y Combinator, and we moved him out from Chicago to Sunnyvale to live with us. And he was programming up to his last days. It's what he wanted to do. He was yeah. a really talented programmer. He made some incredible contributions to Plangrid, and his code is still live in Plangrid today, believe it or not. And before he passed, he actually gave us one of the best gifts he's ever given us, which is introducing us to Kenny Stone, our co-founder and CTO, um, one of the best engineers he's ever worked with. And he knew we couldn't do it alone. He knew we needed Kenny, and I'm so thankful for that. When he passed, I mean, those are some hard days. I can only imagine. You know? How could it not be? Yeah. But. It just forced us to step back and ask ourselves, is this what we want to be doing with our lives? Do we want to be writing construction software knowing that our life is very short here? And our answer then and our answer now is yes, we love the construction industry. This industry employs some of the hardest blue collar workers in the world. And they've never had software. They've never ever had software to do their jobs. And that's why they haven't figured out how to be more productive. And we're the best ones to do it. We actually really care. And I just feel really lucky to be able to realize our best friend's dreams and memory of him. And now we have 150 people who believe in this vision and we're growing strong. So if you're hardworking and you want to help revolutionize the construction industry, uh, we would love to meet you. Plangert.com slash jobs. So, so you have an interesting financial story. You started in Y Combinator, you took some seed money, and then you ran on profits for 
in the first two and a half years, which seems like it shouldn't be that big a deal, but obviously it's not the way most businesses work in, in this area. So having done that, if you had to do it again, would you have taken money earlier or would you have done it the way that you did it? No, because um, I'm actually, I wouldn't do anything differently. I think it just works out this way, right? Um, we did something unheard of, which was build Plangren from literally nothing. Yes, we took a 1.5 million seed round in 2012, but we never spent it. And we grew ourselves from four founders to 30 people. And it just forced us to build a product that users really loved and that would pay us for it. And we were able to find product market fit because we kept ourselves so scrappy and lean. So as a result of that, I'm, I'm guessing that you were pretty independent in your decision making because you didn't have the investors who were there telling you, well, you need to do this and you need to do that and <laughs> you shouldn't be doing this. Um, and now you have $18 million from Sequoia that you got this year as a Series A. And now you have this additional oversight from investors. And I'm wondering how challenging is it for you having been able to make most of your own decisions to have somebody helping you make decisions and asking you to do things differently maybe than you would do. That them. is a good question. Um, so we decided to raise a Series A because we basically grew ourselves to 30 people. And one day it just dawned on us that we were running our multi-million dollar company off of this giant Google Docs spreadsheet that can easily you know, input typos in. So we wanted to choose a business partner to help us grow, to help us build a sales team. We had never thought about sales for three years. And we partnered up with the best firm. And we chose the best person there, Doug Leone, to join our board. And now George Hu, the CEO of Salesforce, is also on our board. And you know, again, I just, I just feel lucky. We, we chose the right people. We partner with the right people. It's not like they come in and yell at us mm -hmm. um, and tell us what to do. They just want us to do our best. They obviously demand excellence from us and they have high expectations, but they're also there to help, and I just feel incredibly thankful for that. But when you, I mean, when you're on your own and you're making your own decisions, I mean, there's, there's good parts of that, right, and bad, bad parts that you don't know what you don't know, um, but there has to be some difference in having that kind of, like, well, I, I can't just make the decision. I have to kind of run it by people. There has to be some difference there for you. Right, right. So there's different approval process, but it's nice. It, we basically see them as sounding boards more than approval processes. So, so when you took this, this money from Sequoia, you went from 30 to 150 employees in how long? What was it, like six months or something? No, no, <laughs> like a year. Yeah, okay. a year. Yeah. So still, yeah. 120 additional people in a year is a lot yeah. of people. Um, so I'm wondering, you were running a company of 30 people, you knew everybody's name, you, you know, it was, it was a family. And then suddenly there's all these new people running around and your job as a manager changes with 150 people. So what were those changes like for you and how did that change your job to have that burst of people come through your door? Uh, I don't know my team members' last names, so that's definitely what's changed. I know all of their first names. Um, it actually feels good. It feels like we're stronger than ever because we've been able to recruit a lot of experienced and talented people that are super smart and we're stronger than ever. So certainly there have been, there have been growing pains um, scaling that way, but it's something that we wanted and it's something that we've adapted to. And again, I, I feel like I'm the luckiest person in this room, you know? Think so about our team back in San Francisco in the office. We only have a few minutes, a uh, few seconds. We have about okay. 40 seconds. So I just want to ask one final question. What's next for Plan Grid? Where do you, where do you see this going? Yeah, Plan Grid is going to be here 50 years from now, 100 years from now. We love this industry and employ some of the hardest working blue collar workers, and we're going to keep doing that. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you.